Hello. Hiya. Finally. Hi there. <laughs> How's it going? Ah, not too bad, thanks. Good. Yeah, technical nightmare. <laughs> oh, it's quite it's quite difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky, all right. It's not straightforward by any means. But well, finally, anyway. How are you keeping? Ah, not too bad. Your, your sounds a wee bit bad. It's a bad again. There's always something, isn't there? I'll I'll speak up. Is that any better? Is that is that, is that any better, everybody? Testing, testing, one, two. <laughs> Big screen, but who, who's whose audio is bad? Is mine's bad or is it the other one? This is motherless. I don't know if mine's is. You seem to be coming through quite clear at probably my end, is it? Yeah, it's the shoot end, he says. Yeah. Try to fix it now. Is that any better? Still a wee bit of a buzz, but. I'll have to sort that out for the next time, definitely. Right, I'll let, I'll let you fire away, just let every, everybody know about your eating disorder history and things like that, and how it all started and things like that as well. For the people who yeah. obviously, they obviously, they're new ones, so... Yeah, you go through it all again. Um, I'm gonna just, have to basically, really... just basically how it began and obviously how you've got to where your recovery is at the moment and things. And, yeah, um, but obviously it is a long story, I'll do the summarised version. Um, yeah, I guess it kind of started for me with uh, depression when I was early teens, 14 or so. Um, and I had that for a long, long time, all through my teens, up to 19. I never uh, sought treatment for it. Uh, just refused point blank, it wasn't something I wanted other people to know about. Um, and then, yeah, I went, I worked as a chef for eight years and everything kind of went hunky dory and everything like yeah. that. And life was going really great. Um, went back to college as a mature student. And yeah, everything was fine. And then, kind of out of the blue, the depression really kicked back in big time. Um, and I'd already started eating healthy. I went vegetarian at 20, 21. Um, just through lifestyle choice entirely. Um, always big animal activist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, then I started working out and feeling a bit better about myself, but I was doing it for self-confidence. Um, yeah, that's that's one thing a lot of people have been asking me lately. They've been asking any tips to about exercising and recovery and things like that. And it's yeah. a kind of hot, it's a kind of bad situation because you don't want to be obviously using your exercise as a coping skill for compensating for your food and things like that. It's about yeah. doing it for the right. Obviously, some people have to exercise obviously in recovery for strengthening your bones and things like that, and obviously strengthening your heart, but. Really, I feel that you shouldn't exercise in recovery, but what's your kind of view on that? Yeah, I totally agree with that, yeah. I think as much as when you're suffering, you don't want to hear it. <laughs> you don't want to hear it, but I don't think it's a good idea in recovery to to exercise. And even still, I've been in full recovery for like, two years now, and even at that, I'm constantly told no. <laughs> Um, I've I've constantly get that urge to exercise because I do suffer fuel for exercise in the past, but I've just got to the point now that I, even though obviously as you well know walking can become an issue because you start to even want to walk a bit further each day and each day and each day and every bit of your life gets taken over with that exercise addiction, so it's quite hard to kind of try and control. But yeah, it's you know it's for your the greater good because. The, it's not going to be forever, but yeah, still, even when you can go back to exercise, it's going to obviously be something you've obviously got to watch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There, you have to 
be very aware of the reasons that you're doing it, I think. Um, Definitely. Um, yeah, when I was, I, I couldn't, I was kind of bedridden for maybe the last three years when my eating disorder was really bad. I couldn't, literally couldn't do it. I had arrhythmia, my blood pressure was on the floor uh, for about three years constantly. Um, my mom used to, she got a, a blood pressure monitor and she used to come in every day and check me. Um, much to my annoyance, but um, my, my blood pressure is really, really low all the time. It's usually a bit over 80, over 60, and things like that. And that's just basically, like I say, it's because of the, re the really, really low body weight and things. But yeah. it's yeah. they say that you basically get the kind of blood pressure yeah, an athlete kind of thing, but it's yeah, but it's not a, a fitness, yeah, no, <laughs> that's sport. that's it, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's literally just your heart. Because your body has been, feed, the first thing your body feeds off in starvation is muscle. Um, that's it, and that's what a lot of people forget, the heart the heart is a muscle and that's yeah. one thing that your body uses up all this kind of tissue first and it's obviously your heart, your organs and things like that. And yeah. A lot of people obviously worry in recovery about when they're putting on weight but they seem to forget that a lot of the calories are used to obviously repair that internal damage before the outer things like the fat because you're the body's smart, it knows it's got to repair the internal damage to keep you alive, so that's the yeah. first thing it's used for. Yeah, exactly. The first, the, 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 the nutrition that you take in first in recovery, it goes straight to your organs. It doesn't go um, anywhere else, it goes straight to cell repair. Um, exactly. And and obviously the most important thing is first your brain and your heart is what it um, goes for. Um, your body is incredibly resilient. I always thought of all the things I put my body through, and it just it wouldn't give up <laughs> even to the last. It That's just, it. Is it your body's be. really resilient when you think of it? Yeah. And um, yeah, my my blood pressure was shocking. It was generally, it was God, what was it? It was 54 over 40 most of the time, um, and literally at that. No joking, no exaggeration. If I stood up off the couch too quickly, I could have a heart attack. It would be too much strain on my heart. Yeah, I was, I was very much the same myself. Obviously, as you well know, I had suffered two heart attacks, yeah. and the second one, I was dead for nine minutes. And yeah. even, even getting up, I was f constantly fainting and everything. It was, it's a terrible situation, and that's why I feel that I, I hate it when people glamorise eating disorders because they don't realise just how, how really. <laughs> lethal they are, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. Yeah. They've got I the highest know. mortality rate for a certain reason. Yeah, I was just going to say that that is the reason that the highest mortality rate is, is the pressure on your heart. Um, that's usually the main killer from it is, is um, cardiac arrest or... Um, and obviously with the bin binging, even with people with binging and purging, as you well know, they can suffer a, an electrolytes problems, which is yeah. the potassium that regulates your heart. That can cause a heart attack as well, and that is quite a big reason why they pass away. Yeah, any malnourishment is just it's 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 damaging your body from the get go. From the minute you start restricting, and I don't mean restricting in like people think restricting or anorexic or whatever you you don't eat ever. Um, and like you as far for the truth. Yeah, that's not the case, but any kind of malnourishment, even in everyday society, people who aren't getting the right vitamins, minerals, whatever, in their diets, um, it causes huge problems to your body. Um, like, for example, just in general, when you're morbidly obese, you can very quickly develop diabetes because of the insulin uh, deficiencies and imbalances and all of that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, like you said yourself, but when you are chronic, when your weight does get to a point where it's difficult to function, it, you know yourself, it's very hard to express the day to day and the absolute struggle of that. Um, That's it, because y y your brain's starved as well, and yeah. even your cognitive abilities and your thinking is way off the chart, and you just, yeah. you're, you're not able to concentrate and put into words, and obviously, your, your eating disorder thrives in that secrecy of the eating disorder, so you're not going to speak out about it anyway and tell anybody how you're feeling, and yeah. obviously to take away that control kind of thing. Yeah, um, 
it was kind of the opposite for me. I was always very, very open about my anorexia, about my. That's eating. that's great. Yeah, in some ways, but um, I was very aware of what I was doing, and at the time for me, it had kind of become a mission for me just to destroy myself. I always um, saw my eating disorder as a form of self harm. It was just my destruction, and that's what my mission was. Um, and I was very open about it and being an adult and stuff, my parents couldn't do anything. They couldn't just, you know, send me into treatment because ultimately it was my choice. Well, um, that's, that's different. It's different when we are, we are a younger person. They, they, they're, they're eating disorders taking out their hands and their cares and the, the hands of their parents and things like that. Yeah. But when you're an ad adolescent, it's a different matter altogether, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is different. Um, I did have all the support in the world around me. My parents were great, but they just couldn't convince me either way to go. That's what I think. You can you can have all the the care and support in the world, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's down to you to actually put in the work. And you've got to want it for yourself. It's all yeah. great. You, you can be in the hospital. You can you, you get in there and put on weight. You come back out knowing only too fine well that you're going to lose all that weight again. And that's what it's kind of tricking in. Is, yeah. Half the time, half the time they send you into these psychiatric units, and you're, you're just sent in there, and they're, they're focusing on the weight gain rather than the mental illness, and you're basically sent back out and the very same issue going on, as you well yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I definitely, I experienced that the first time I went inpatient. It was um, to the point again where doctors were forcing me to go. Um, so I, I did finally go, but very much against my will, had to be dragged there. Um, I just remember dreading it. Um, and yeah, it was the same thing, very difficult situation, it was just refeeding. And I wasn't getting any psychotherapy in tandem with it because their, their view was that I wasn't cognitively uh, competent to have any. Yeah, I was, I was exactly the same. Basically, yeah. they told, they told me that you would never really be able to get to a BMI, uh, uh, the roughly 21, before you can start dealing with the kind of mental illness side of it. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's, I really disagree with that, with that way that they treat in that you do need support because it's a total catch 22. Um, you don't want to eat because you can't. Uh, rationalize it in your head and yet they're saying you have to eat to be able to rationalize it so you're caught in this middle ground um, but you do need support in that initial refeeding you, you at least need yeah. somebody to keep telling you that you're doing the right thing and I think most importantly for me the huge thing that helped was to know that I was safe um, I had somebody supporting me that always told me that it's safe it's the right thing to do um, nobody is taking away your eating disorder. Nobody is taking anything away from you. Your eating Not disorder takes everything away from you. Exactly. It gradually yeah. takes takes everything you love, your family, your yeah. friends, isolates you then. Eventually, as you well know, it can take your life and that's yeah. that's what you've got to realise and that's where, where recovery comes in. That you, it's, it's your eating disorder or you is, it's basically hell for, hell for death as you will know. Yeah, exactly. And even in the in the early stages of it, like if anybody out there is restricting or finding it difficult or... I think even if you don't know that you necessarily have an eating disorder, like a full-blown eating disorder, um, when you start restricting or playing around with your diet, in direct relation to worrying about what other people think of you and or or hating yourself or thinking oh I'm this I'm that I need to fix this I need to fix that um, and if you're skipping meals and substituting things and not eating full portions that's um, um, that is kind of that's that's the time when you really really want to try and be aware of it and even if that at that stage if you can get help um because it can just take off so quickly um, that's it even even like you say missing one meal it'll gradually spirals out of control because your eating disorder latches onto any wee small aspect of the 
the sword they're yeah. patting out the can and keeps back yeah. in. You've, it's basically you've got to stick to a meal plan, eating by yeah. the clock if you obviously, because you've not got the hunger cues and things as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even for people with a generally, you know, healthy attitude towards life, but if you're going to the gym all the time and stuff like that, I know fitness and the fitness industry on YouTube is massive at the moment and everything. And I tend to see loads of people on the bus coming home with like buckets of protein powder and this, that and the other. And I think to myself, eat food. You know, there is none, exactly. of, this, none of this crap. I mean, that's all chemicals. That's all exactly. shit that was made in a lab. It's not nutrition. And um, humans weren't supposed to eat like that. <laughs> that's, that's why you wonder when this thing that they're talking about, super meat and things like that, I feel that's... That's another thing. It's a bit yeah. the kind of ethical side of it as well, and you think you think of it as it is it really safe because it's they can basically it's like it's Frankenstein meat if you think of it realistically. Yeah, it they can really adapt it to any way they want. They can can adapt to obviously the fat content, the cholesterol content. And yeah, and yeah, I don't to, know. I, I always kind of one side of it that pisses me off is like the health industry and the health food stores. Um, if they were in any way interested in your overall health, things would be very, very different. They're, I don't mean to sound cynical, but I am. <laughs> and it, it's all to make money. They don't care That's about it. your health. They don't give a shit about the individual's health. Um, and yeah, those, I, you see it everywhere now in shops. Protein bars, protein shakes, protein cookies, protein everything protein yeah um, that the basically the social p media pressure as you think about the the perfect body and this that and the next thing you've got slim fast you've got juice plus you've got herbalife yeah. that's one thing that i think w worries a lot of people in eating disorders i don't know if this is something that you suffer with but when people you see people mentioning diets and get on about their weight and things like that it can obviously trigger a lot of people and do you feel that kind of does with some people yeah, definitely. It is difficult. I often found that myself in the in the beginning of my eating disorder. In fact, used to drive me nuts. Is that everybody seems obsessed about their weight and about food and all the rest of it? Yeah, definitely. It is, it is just something that it happens in society. And I remember thinking I'd hear my friends and stuff saying, you know, you'd be out and there'd be drinks and whatever, and they were like, oh, I'll just have one more, and and then ten minutes later they're going, oh God, I wish I hadn't eaten that. And I'd be sitting there going, well, just don't eat it then. That was where my logic went to. And I thought, rather than complaining all the time, just don't eat it. <laughs> but that's that. I actually was watching a video from Eric Electric. I actually I love his channel. Mm -hmm. And he was on about calories and things like that. And he was saying you should never count calories. But he says, even a healthy person that hasn't got an eating disorder, he says, you were, you were born knowing what when you're, when you're full when you want food when you don't want food he says don't ever count calories he says it's just not natural he says your body will tell you what you need and what you need and he says at the end of the day your, your body weight is going to get up and down all through your life he says just enjoy your food and get a good relationship with it absolutely great recommendations you know what i mean it's yeah definitely true yeah it is i think the fundamental thing I think a lot of the time people, people, there's not that much education out there, I mean there's no education in schools about nourishment and nutrition and stuff, and it's amazing the amount of people who don't actually understand it and know what their body needs, and like the baseline figures, general standard always have been in every country in the world, is two to 2,200 calories for a woman, and 2,000 to 2,500 for a man. And those are the figures that every human being walking this planet, that's what you need in a day. Exactly, and then obviously if you're in eating disorder recovery, it's probably about another thousand or more in top of it, at least. Yeah, yeah, if you're an athlete, obviously, and I mean, I mean a competing athlete, obviously you're going to need a lot more, because calories are energy. That's and exactly it. For everyday people, all of that energy it doesn't go to, you know, it doesn't mean energy that you have to go out and run and you have to walk or any of that stuff. It's just literally 
functioning energy. It's the energy it takes your organs to run, your blood to exactly. circulate, your eyes, your brain. Yeah, basic, basic yeah. metabolic rate. Exactly, yeah. And even if somebody is lying in a coma for a day, not even moving, not even thinking, your body burns 1400 calories just from existing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when you think about it, those six, seven hundred, a little bit more, uh, they go into your everyday function and you're, you know, going to work, walking to the bus. Definitely, around. yeah. That's just baseline. That's just what every human being on the planet needs to exist. Um, so when you go under that, you are under eating. Um, and if you do it two, three, four days in the week, you'll find that you've, you've technically under eaten by two, three days when you add it exactly, up. Exactly, yeah. And that is literally like going for three days without any kind of food. And if you considered doing that to someone else, you would never do that to someone else. And I think a lot of the time in recovery, it's very important to try and keep that in mind, would you treat someone else the way you treat yourself, the way you're treating yourself right now? Um, Definitely, yeah. You've and the answer for everybody is no. And the one bit that's hard to find for yourself in recovery is that compassion for yourself, that you deserve it, that you need it. Um, and I, I can't stress enough how much you do deserve it and you do need it and everybody deserves to live healthily and happily um, and that's something that it does take a bit of work um, because I think if you have a background where you have a trauma or your uh, depression or whatever the reason for your eating disorder you're already on the back foot in that compassion for yourself because it's one of the things that goes first when you have a problem exactly like that. that that's one thing that i found you, you you want to help other people but you've got to realize that you've got to help yourself first to be in a place to actually be able to help other people yeah, yeah generally exactly. that's that's what it is we're an eating disorder you you're the last person you want to help really yeah yeah and people you know when you get an eating disorder or anything like that any mental illness you you do tend to be a sensitive person, a very um, empathetic person, someone who thinks quite deeply. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, that's why the, those issues affect people like that, is because you are more aware. Um, a lot of people obviously say as well, well, you've got this kind of perfectionist persona. A lot of people have that. It's, they're yeah. really high achievers. They love to be perfectionists. And, a lot of people obviously suffer from OCD and things, and they, they do say that that's a kind of precursor to eating disorders, which it seems to go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, it does definitely that perfectionist side of it, and hard working, and all of those sorts of things. That definitely, um, I think it's it's in you already, and then it just becomes heightened with numbers and targets and blah and blah and counting and, and the perfect weight and how you want a certain part of your body to look and you'll work on it and all the rest of but it. But I always say that you, the, the weight on the scales doesn't equate to how much you've done for people, how much people love you and it's, it means nothing but to an eating disorder it's the numbers are everything as you well know. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, and the one difficult thing to find as well during recovery is, is um, patience it does take a lot of patience to get where you need to get to um yeah because obviously you well know it's you get stumbling blocks and there's obviously eating disorder recovery is no linear as you know it's you're going to get days yeah. where you're going to you're going to relapse and things like that but it's about going to bed getting up the next day and choosing recovery again and battling on and you're winning every day that you do that yeah exactly and just to be I think the main advice I'd, I'd give in recovery is just to be compassionate and patient with yourself. Give yourself a break. Jesus, you've been through some shit. <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 a, it's an ingrained behaviour. It's, if it's been there for all those years, years, it's not just going to snap next day it's away. It's yeah. for anything. Yeah. It's about retraining your brain and the same goes. Yeah, yeah. 
and your body needs serious time to recoup and and to um, fix that deficit that it's at with your with the nutrition that you're giving it now um and i was very much the same i thought i could run before i could walk um yeah i was in myself definitely yeah and you're just you're dying for it you get the first taste of recovery and you start to feel a bit better and my god it's such a relief when you felt so crap for so long um exactly so, yeah and food just becomes this wow you know I, I feel energetic again and life is coming back to me and you get so enthusiastic about things um but that's then, one thing you've got to watch you you, you kind of Sometimes you can tend to take your eye off the ball a bit and take things too easy and you think, oh, I'm recovered, I'm doing great, but you've got to stay on it 24-7 because, as you well know. Yeah, because yeah. there's, there's so many areas then you kind of, if you're doing it at home and all the rest of it, but then you put yourself in a different situation and all those factors come in and then it's difficult to cope because you haven't done that yet either. Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously a lot easier in hospital because you've obviously not got the the outside pressures, you forget that you've got daily life and things like that and you don't yeah. take that into consideration when you're in the hospital until you get outside and then you realise you've got things like your, your work that you may be doing in the house, your stresses with bills or whatever and family life and all that takes its toll mentally as well and you've got to kind of take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing to remember is with all that going on is to not lose sight of what is the most important and the most important thing in recovery is yourself um, and to get your nutrition in and to take breaks and you know go and take a nap your body really needs to regenerate um, go and sit down chill take half hours in the day where you just do something for yourself just read watch some crap or whatever um, exactly yeah and yeah just take it easy on yourself and then the more nourished your body is going to get you will cope with those day-to-day -day things better uh, because of your recovery and because of better nutrition uh, so it's difficult to begin with you know like you said yourself coping with the day-to-day -day. but just always remember that when your health is good those things are so much easier to deal with um, a, a, que a question that I got that somebody was wanting to ask you was, why, why in your opinion is it, is it not always possible to be veggie or vegan in recovery from an eating disorder and especially as an inpatient? Yeah, um, I think it's a very good uh, statute that they have you know, in, in place. It's, I think it causes a lot of controversy with a lot of people. It freaked me out when I went inpatient first because they were no to vegetarianism. It wasn't even an option in the hospital. Well, um, see, the hospital, the hospital I was in, they, they, they advocated they, they allow you to be be vegetarian, but there was very, very there was maybe only like one option on, on yeah. for each meal, but yeah. vegan just out of the question because as you well know. A lot of people with any eating disorders can obviously use being vegan as a mask to obviously their eating disorder so they can restrict and avoid certain food groups. So I feel that's kind of why that, that that's going to avoid it, but it's yeah. maybe changing shortly. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is also difficult to get <clears throat> the nutrition in, in recovery when you're at a deficit. It's very hard to get nutrition in from a vegan diet. It just is. It's not like um, very low calorie it, foods. It's you need a massive, massive volume, really. Yeah. In in hospital, what they rely on generally for for refeeding and and getting the nourishment in quickly would be <clears throat> things that have high protein, high fats in them, and they're hard to find in a veg in, in a vegan diet. That's um, it. Yeah. Things like eggs, yogurts, milk. Uh, in hospital generally you have full fat milk with every meal and it, that's not there as a torture thing I know to people who might be watching with an ED would be thinking oh my god I couldn't do that um, <laughs> and well, like, I, like I said to uh, somebody the other day there they were telling me they were worried about they're vegan and they were going into the hospital for their eating disorder and they said they really didn't want the they weren't going to eat anything but like I told them, I says, think about it realistically. 
for the sake of your health, get in there, maybe spending four or five weeks eating a, a normal standard diet. You can come back out being a healthy place, then get back to being vegan. But the most important thing is you getting your calories in, getting your health in a place yeah. before you're able to help any animals or anything. You've got to think of that. Yeah. You won't be here to help anyone or anything if you don't take care of yourself. No. In that situation, yes, it's difficult when you feel like you're leaving your morals behind and everything. But you really have to just think of food as medicine. When you're that's exactly that's exactly what it is. Yeah, definitely. That's that's your treatment. If you don't take it, you're not going to get better. Um, and yeah, it's it's also apart from the nutritional side, it's it's difficult um, for the brain side of things to choose a lifestyle like that. Generally, I hate to say it, but ninety percent of the time, it does tend to be. A technique of the eating disorder to use Definitely. the diet mm. in order to uh, restrict calories or say, "Oh no, thanks, not for me." Um, that's that's why I made it plainly obvious to my eating disorder recovery team. Like I said, they they told me if I was going to go vegan, they would support me as long as I was having the, the exact same type of foods that I was having when before I went vegan, i.e chocolate cakes all high calorie stuff yeah. and that's that's what i wanted to do anyway because there was no way like i don't believe in this rotto four crap and 80 10 10 and thing because yeah. basically you're just you're just swapping one disordered eating pattern for another and you're never going to you may recover as in body weight but you're never going to be recovered in the mental side of things if you're doing that yeah and you can you can see it with everyday people who who restrict or who diet or um, are very strict with themselves. Um, it's the same thing. They go, you know, oh, not for me, and I'll, I'll never eat that, and I won't eat that. And that is that is dangerous when I see people do that. It's, it's the key to everything is everything in moderation. When Definitely. You about, when people ask questions like, what should I eat in recovery? What should I have for meals? What should I do this? The answer to that question is you eat whatever you want. That's ex that's exactly what I say. You eat what you want, when you want. Listen to your body, because at the end of the day, the end of the day, you need to have a good relationship with all food groups, and that means proteins, fats, carbs, a wee bit of junk food, all does you good, especially in recovery. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You eat whatever you want at the times you want, however much you want. Because, As much you want. <laughs> yeah, because that there is nothing wrong with food. And the ED has just twisted that side of your brain into thinking that there is no food is bad food. And no. There is there is just no such thing. Um, and yeah, if you have a thing for biscuits, you have your biscuits. Um, the problem comes in when because of your ED rules. The problem is not food and real life and living and having those things. The problems have been all caused by your ED thinking, I won't have biscuits today, I won't have biscuits today, and it becomes an obsession. And then you think you can never have biscuits. Yeah, it becomes, becomes a fear food virtually. Yeah, but the thing is... That's 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 one thing that I was going to ask you. What, what kind of is your kind of tips on uh, for going about fear foods? One, one thing that I do use is adding in like a fear food with a safe food and then gradually like increasing it more and more and having it more but I feel that works a lot with eating disorder and fear foods really. Yeah, yeah it does. Um, yeah, balancing it in, adding it back into meals if it's a fear food for you. Put it on the plate and commit to it. That's the other thing is you put that on your plate. A part of you really, really wants it. And that's why you you put it on your plate because you do actually want to eat it and by God you want to enjoy food again. <laughs> it's nice. What, one of the one of the things I would do is I would go out and I would buy foods that I absolutely loved, knowing fine that I wouldn't eat them, but it was just that feeling of having them in your house and in the cupboard. You would go down and you would look at them and that's your eating disorder trying to have that control over you. And it's yeah. basically like, oh, I've got this food and I'm, but you know fine you're not going to use it. It's, People with eating disorder, without eating disorders would probably not understand this and think, oh, that's crazy yeah. thinking, but it's one thing we do do. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and when you think of it, that, that that temptation isn't. That's just horrible. That's how awful it is to live with an eating disorder. It's torturous. That's, that's definitely absolutely a horrible way to have to live. To say that there's something there, but you can't have it. And okay, you could have it, but you truly feel that you can't have it. That something terrible is going to happen, you're going to hate yourself, you'll have to exercise this, that and the other um, and all of that seems like it's not worth it but it is worth it because it's not worth being sick and dying from this disease No. Nope. Um, and the thing is you can have those foods, whatever they are not even like chocolate cake or whatever, you know um, exactly they're lovely, they're treats, they're nice, they're part of life, they're part of vibrant. I, ha I have them every day and I, 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 every day I set myself a new challenge of getting in a food that I, that I just love and I don't fear foods anymore. And I've, I've probably got only one thing that I really fear and that is butter and I, I have done for years and years but I really need to get over that. Yeah, yeah. There, there are things that definitely become big hang-ups and... I think the, the thing with those things is just take the bull by the horns, just, I mean, for yourself, if you, next time you have a piece of toast, put a scrape of butter on it, don't, you know, don't um, overwhelm yourself, I think, don't have loads or whatever, or even get yourself one cracker, one small cracker, exactly. a, skim, a skim of butter on it, um, and yeah, just, maybe try it and then just introduce yourself to it and once you go there and you prove to yourself that nothing terrible is going to happen and it really isn't going to make a difference in your body in the day that gives you the confidence to go back to it again and um, and, and then build on that if you want to you know and then and then before you know it you're doing it <laughs> Exactly. Um, One thing I was going to ask you as well, a lot of people have been asking me, they worry constantly about constantly gaining weight and them, their weight not stopping once they get to a certain weight. But like I tell them, you get your body's got a set point and it will eventually put, level out. But it's yeah. really, really important that you don't worry about that. It's not going to happen forever. And what's yeah. your kind of views on this? Yeah, definitely, it, it, it is worrisome in the beginning that oh, I'm just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and the weight is going to go on and on, it's not going to stop. It does stop. Um, in, in recovery, you're, you're eating excess calories, like you said, yourself as well, to repair the damage and to give your body that the best footing it can for, for getting back to health. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not going to be eating like that all the time. You're not going to be eating like that for the rest of your life. Um, no. For however long you're in recovery, how, however long it takes to repair the damage, you you then you will you will feel it in yourself, and you'll know you don't need as many calories, and you can just even things out and level things off, and um, just get into a routine of your three meals and your snacks, and stick to that, and that will be enough for your body and you can be back to your, your regular 2,000 yep. whatever calories um, and you, you won't keep gaining weight, you won't lose control um, like I said it all goes to the organs in your body first your body. definitely that's that's the most important thing to keep you alive yeah. as you well know and a lot of people worry about the weight gain, but like I told them at the start anyway, a lot of the, 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 the weight you gain at the very, very start is basically glycogen depletion, it's water loss, and that's what comes back on, and most of that is just water loss, fluid, and yeah. the body yeah, gains I, that first. Yeah, I, I had that when I first went for refeeding, I had really, really bad edema, uh, which is water retention. I had that myself, yeah. yeah. And it's swelling, it's swelling of the legs and the face and things that go on. Yeah, yeah, it's incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> Another reason not to entertain an eating disorder as any kind of a. It's usually that's usually one of the first signs, of obviously, the feeding syndrome, as you well know. 
yeah. recently where your body is, can, can go into shock once you start reintroducing food and it can be, like, be fatal actually, it can actually cause you to have a heart attack as you well know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was on I was on complete bed rest for the first six weeks in hospital. I was the same, yeah. Yeah, literally you're not allowed to put your feet on the floor, you're wheeled to and from the bathroom yeah. with somebody watching you, weighing what you do in the bathroom. Oh, wait a wee minute, I just need to... Sure. Sorry about that, it was just my wife shouting me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um... Yeah, the edema, it was, um, when your body is lacking proteins, um, the cell walls start to break down and you can't, the cells obviously aren't as strong as they were, um, so because of the lack of protein and obviously other things in your diet, um, the cells become weakened and porous and they can't hold uh, liquid in your body. Yeah. So it seeps out of your cells and also any liquids that you take in, your your cells can't hold them to process it, so it goes into the tissue in your body. Which um sounds horrible. It is horrible. You don't want it ever to happen to you. No. Um, and then the the swelling is awful. It's absolutely awful because the skin stretches, you itch. I actually had it sores and things because of it is I had to get a special mattress and things like that and it was just was it was absolutely saying, terrible. Yeah, I was sleeping on an air mattress in the hospital because um because I had no flesh on my bones. I haven't actually sat down at home for about two years because I couldn't sit on a chair. It was No, it's, you've bad. obviously not got the padding and things like that as well. It's yeah. terrible, I mean I would even remember you had about I had about three and four layers of clothes on at times. I would be going to my bed with a hat and a scarf and things on, and it's yeah. amazing to think, but it's that's what happens. Yeah, that's another side of it. Is the cold is just absolutely awful. You can you can feel it in your bones. In the in the summer, I used to wear three fleeces, like you said, a hat, scarf, two duvets. Yeah. I was in bed, and I used to fear going outside because the cold hurt. I remember being able to feel my organs, I could feel my lungs were actually cold um, and you just, you can't get the heat into you either because you basically the, the furnace in your body has nothing to burn anymore um, so you can't produce your own heat um, and then obviously because you're, when your blood pressure is low your, your heart isn't pumping your blood the way it should so your circulation isn't getting to your extremities. That's it, um, yeah. And I still, to this day, I have huge problems with my circulation. I can, I have very little sensation of my feet. My feet are my feet. Well, just, just when you're saying that, actually, Ma, I've actually got uh, nerve damage from the knee down, and I've got a drop left foot, and I've got no feeling in my toes. I can't move my foot at all. And that's yeah. basically sciatic nerve damage, obviously caused by the weight loss and nerve damage done to the buttocks and obviously yeah. you're losing weight so yeah. I say there's, there's a, a vast amount of damage that can be done it's yeah yeah it is not glamorous it is not fun and it is no joke and it's it's yeah that, that's why I'm so very I'm very passionate about trying to spread the message and, and to try and help definitely to, you're, to you're, you're an absolute inspiration uh, you've helped me so much and I just that's what I said tell everybody uh, you've, you're a beautiful person and okay. everybody sees it is any anybody like to ask any questions before we go just fire away at a I'm going to soon, you're very inspiring. <laughs> I'm going to, do you, would you like to ask Andy any questions before we go on?
No, I, I guess that's him. Would, would, would you like to mention your YouTube channel and get them to check it out? Um, yeah, I've started uploading a few more videos to it. Um, I got back to it a couple of days ago, and I've just I've got a load of videos that are ready to go up. Yeah. Uh, because I documented everything in my recovery from the time I went to hospital up till now. Uh, so it's all going up in chronological order, so you can kind of see a before and after. It's Andy, Andy Bush it is, isn't it? Andy Bush, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I kind of, looking at it now, at the time I was doing it for myself, it was incredibly helpful to have meals with the camera, because I could talk to someone and it wasn't as... It still was pressure because I knew my friends were watching and if I failed, I was failing, so it was very helpful. But now seeing the seeing the videos back, I think it's great to kind of see it then and now because, like, yeah, your friends were asking about um, the constant weight gain and things. Yeah. And all, those, all those worries that you have in recovery from my videos from then till oh. now and in recovery, um, you can kind of see those myths and stuff kind of being dispelled because I'm not continually putting on weight. I'm not exactly. Um, I'm not going to explode or whatever. I can function. Um, my health has improved in so many ways. Um, so to see the progression, I thought was, you know, hopefully it will be really helpful to people and and hopeful as well. Because it's been great. absolutely great speaking to you again. It really, really has. <laughs> that's cool. You have a that's lovely day. Yeah, you too. Speak to you soon, Andy. Thanks that's very much. Good. Take care. Bye. Come on, Fudge. And remember, guys, binge on life, purge negativity, and starve guilty feelings. Speak to you all soon and love you so much.